Welcome everyone to the 2021 ASEE Educational Research and Methods Division Distinguished Lecture, and it sure is distinguished today. Uh, we have four outstanding panelists, um, and we will be discussing, they will be just continuing the conversation, working towards anti-racist engineering education. So we're welcoming, um, sorry, there we go. We're welcoming um, Dr. Kelly Cross at the University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, Dr. Cross is an assistant professor of chemical engineering at the University of Nevada, Reno, and um, is an, a leader in the area of uh, culturally responsive curriculum, education, and research. Um, we also have Dr. James Holly Jr., a, assistant professor of mechanical, uh, I'm sorry, of STEM education um, in, at Wayne State University. And uh, James uh, studies um, STEM educators, preparing STEM educators um, to help uh, urban non-white students uh, enter STEM fields. And we have Dr. Leroy Long III from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Dr. Long is an assistant professor of engineering fundamentals there and um, also has a, a vibrant research group that's looking at um, minoritized student athletes and engineers, uh, that combination and helping them to succeed. And finally, we have Dr. Ebony McGee, um, Associate Professor of STEM Education at Vanderbilt University. Um, and Dr. McGee has been working also in the area of, of um, racially marginalized and minoritized populations in STEM education. So um, I'm very excited to be moderating this session. I'm Dr. Lisa Benson from Clemson University and the editor of the Journal of Engineering Education. And I'm sorry, I was supposed to be doing this while I was introducing everyone. And also, I can't see my notes, so I hope I got all of your introductions right. We'll have a chance to introduce yourselves in a moment, but I wanted to first briefly say how this conversation got started. So in 2020, um, racism was front and center in the headlines, and there were some who were understanding and promoting the idea that there needs to be a discussion about racism in engineering education and in the Journal of Engineering Education in particular. And all of these individuals have been pushing this conversation forward in our community, and they, they were invited to um, contribute materials to, to open up that conversation in the Journal of Engineering Education. So Kelly Cross published um, an outstanding guest editorial that really set the, the stage for the history of what's been going on, racism in engineering and engineering education. James Holly Jr pushed this conversation towards the research that, that's going on, disentangling engineering education research anti-blackness and how we can cite um, authors of color in our work. And then Leroy Long pushed the conversation towards curriculum and anti-racist engineering classroom and, and basically a starter kit for educators. Finally, Ebony McGee really literally wrapped it up in the cover of uh, graphic for the, the, the October issue with her graphic showing um, online coaching for black engineering professoriate bound students. So um, we tried to continue, we tried to give voice to this conversation and not just have this archived in the journal. And we um, had a video discussion with uh, Kelly, James, Leroy, and Ebony in October of 2020. And this actually is a QR code for the, the YouTube video, and I'd be happy to share that with anyone who wants uh, to view that after this um, session. But now this session is meant to continue the conversation and really working towards anti-racist engineering education. So I welcome these panelists to briefly introduce yourselves and, and fix anything that I got wrong. Um, and also tell us a little bit about your piece and what you see as the next steps for working towards an anti-racist agenda in, in engineering education. So we'll start with Dr. Cross. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Lisa. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get the party started. Um, in short, uh, my piece did look uh, historically back at sort of how the racism is sort of embedded within our within the U.S. culture and how some of that has turned into, you know, things that we're seeing repeat themselves 
even right now, um, in terms of what we're noticing and witnessing in terms of our society and our, and our community. And then I also related that uh, specifically to engineering, uh, some of that history, how that's related uh, through the military uh, in various ways. And then uh, essentially, my paper was a call to action. Uh, I was looking for our white colleagues to start to educate themselves, not only about the history, but then also learning about how that history is playing out today in our classrooms, in our research groups, in our conversations, in our conference, right? How is that sort of systemic and institutionalized racism actually still affecting us today? And so that was my point was to kind of educate yourself. I do have a pretty lengthy reading list um, associated with that. But again, that was pretty much my call was to encourage those who don't understand and who are not aware to educate yourself, to understand, again, the history, to look back, to understand where we are now. In terms of answering your question directly, um, in terms of what needs to happen next, I still, even based on this conference this week, uh, there still needs to be education. There are still people that need to understand and the, the scale and scope of the racism that's integrated and, again, institutionalized. And hopefully we'll get into that as, we, as this panel goes on. But understanding that the racism is institutionalized, is systemic, so it's not we have to break that cycle. Um, and so some of my work around, uh, I did earlier this, this week, uh, a workshop on power and privilege. And we talked specifically about that that cycle has to be broken. If we don't step out of that cycle, it will just continue to repeat itself. So that's where I think we need to go next, looking at actual steps that we can take to stop and disrupt the white supremacist culture that we've all been socialized in. And with that, I'll hand it off to James. All right, so uh, hello everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, glad that's an opportunity to be presented as a sting distinguished lecturer among these intellectuals. Uh, one thing I would correct that you said, at least thanks for the intro, but uh, my piece focuses on specifically citing black people, um, and we can get into the specificity of our why, but I did want to look at, like, you know, our respect, uh, calls for solidarity across race and things like that, but my work specifically focuses on black people. Uh, my for foray or intro into this, this thing that we're now talking about today was actually I was invited by Leroy to submit a piece um, following uh, the murder of George Floyd and just the reaction that people were giving. Uh, he asked me to submit a piece to help the community think about just something. And initially I was like, no, I'm good. Like, I'm still processing this myself. Um, I think the, the trauma of it all, because it wasn't just George Floyd's murder. At the time, we had also heard about uh, Amar Aubrey and the way he's been killed and shown video, uh, Breonna Taylor. And then following, there was a lot of other cases, too. And so I was just processing that. It was summertime. The pandemic was hitting. Uh, black folks were shown to be disproportionately dying from that. So I was processing that, but he kept asking. And what I figured is, okay, if I'm going to write this piece, I want folks to connect what they're seeing in the news and what they're feeling and thinking to the actual work that we do. And when I thought about the work, from my lens, I was thinking as a researcher, as a scholar. Um, and so that's why I tried to locate the ways that what people were seeing. And, and I didn't want to try to make death in terms of career opportunities and aspirations equal with the like physical body death and like your, your breath being taken away from you and murder taking place. But I wanted to draw uh, somewhat, I guess, a nagless, a na nagless situation to the ways in which black people aren't allowed to breathe within the discipline or to exist and are pushed out in their dreams really is more than just choosing other majors, but their aspirations of what they thought they would be are what Langston Hughes called dreams deferred. And so that's the connection I want to highlight by um, talking about citation practices, talking about methodological choices, talking about theoretical frameworks to choosing and, and, and research questions and how we frame the problem, uh, how we ignore looking at historically black institutions. And so I do think it's important to kind of define or state how I define anti-blackness um, just so we on the same page. But uh, Warren and Coles described anti-blackness as the socially constructed rendering of black bodies as inhuman, disposable and inherently problematic. 
which like racism goes beyond inter interpersonal prejudice, whereas where uh, engineering education likes to focus on interpersonal prejudice. Um, it is the inability of American culture to see black people as more than slaves, thereby causing active participation or silent complicity. So either you're actively doing it or you're not stopping others from doing it in the literal and figurative death of black people. And so this is more than diverse representation. This is, this is more than just, you know, uh, having more black people to be in the classroom or to teach or to serve as deans, but it's really about the, the construction of engineering knowledge and research practice that um, have outcomes that, that effectively cause our death. All right, I guess it's my turn to go next. So um, when everything was going on, I was in a similar mindset to James. I didn't think about doing anything like this. And I didn't provide this backstory when we met previously, but it was actually a law professor at my church um, because we're both involved in ministry um, at the church who was pushing me to try to use this space and this platform to say something meaningful. Uh, and to be honest, he does take a lot of jabs at engineers. He thinks it's a very hypocritical profession that um, professes to be you know so good and noble and helpful when it's really racist and destructive to be honest and he thinks a lot of people in engineering are cowardly um so i'm just being as blunt as i can i'm not going to name him in case he's not comfortable with it he probably is but i'm not going to uh, but that was like what was going on in my mind so similar to james i had checked out really wasn't planning on doing anything i actually was in the process of trying to put together my tenure package and submit um career for the last time so I had no plans to write or do anything, but he really pushed me and nudged me. And we had done a local kind of like protest and it felt really good to me. So I'm like, let me continue to receive his advice. There's a group chat on WhatsApp for black engineering educators, uh, mainly those who are like in my peer group. So either postdocs, um, some PhD students potentially might be in there. I can't remember. And then mainly assistant professors. James is not in there. Kelly is not in there. So I reached out to them directly. And I also just felt like they were more visible and what they were doing in this space, uh, more vocal and just kind of raw and edgy. And I thought we needed that. You know, I wanted a balanced perspective. Uh, I wanted to hit across different, um, you know, intersecting identities within the black population to show we're not just one monolith, we're not one voice. Uh, so I wanted that to come across and be transparent, but I really wasn't trying to make this about me, even though I felt called to do it. I wanted to provide a space or platform for others to share their voice and hopefully that came across. But in terms of my specific piece, basically I just feel like the classroom is the space where faculty and students interact the most. And I feel like there's a lot of unlearning and learning that needs to take place. The entire curriculum really needs to be um, destroyed, you know, dismantled, taken apart and recreated so that black people are celebrated. Um, and that's accurate because it's really based on a lot of lies. Um, and so I just wanted that to come across and I wanted to shout out, especially a giant of our field who many people aren't aware of in engineering education, although she's well known in education holistically, Ebony McGee. And so I felt like most of what I was doing was citing her work through a direct call to action for people to implement it and the work of other scholars in the field. And so in some ways, I apologize for inviting you all because I understand those stress um, and we're having to even relive the George Floyd situation. So it's like reintroducing trauma. So part of me regrets even inviting anyone, you know, or doing this myself. And then another part of me feels like hopefully some good will take off and we can remove the burden from our shoulders and place it on the shoulders of the audience members here because it shouldn't just be on us. Wow. Look at these young warriors up in here. <laughs> Getting ready for the STEM revolution. Awesome. When you say giant, it kind of makes me feel, oh, like I still want to be in this mix with you all and building with you all. Um, Lisa, do you, I, so I'm the only person who has slides. It's okay. I have some things I want to say and I can best do it that way. You mind if I stop sharing? Okay. Thank no you. No problem at all. Let me just make sure um, I didn't check. Can, can you? Okay, perfect. Yeah, it's manifesting itself. Thank you. Um, so I just was going to talk a little more about the image that you saw on the cover of the October issue. Uh, but the backstory is me and my co-founder, Dr. William Robinson, who is a professor of electrical engineering at Vanderbilt, we were looking at uh, a bunch of STEM mentoring programs, particularly as it relates to diverse populations. 
And of course, we understood there were a lot of positive to mentoring programs, but we also saw there was a lack of explicit conversation and dialogue about what it means to be a faculty of color, a student of color, particularly a woman of color in these hostile and, and racially toxic places and spaces. And we saw mentoring programs who did give you like a shot of diversity, you know, that that's what I call it. Cause it's like, okay, let's have our, our diversity moment. They often were stigmatizing, they were tokenizing, often teach the assimilationist strategies and behaviors, even told people to like straighten their hair and get rid of their tattoos. Like, what does that have to do with being a mechanical engineer in the first place? And then, you know, often when caring white mentors came through, it was like, we're going to save these black students. And really, you know, black students are often saving you, saving the field, right? saving the field from the militarism, the competitiveness, the let's be China, like we don't want to build bombs, we want to build our communities, right? So you're not saving anybody, we're actually the ones who, you know, can save the planet. And then just to have a Black people moment here when we talk about, you know, well, I had it hard and I struggled and now you just going to have to struggle. Well, if 25 years ago you were struggling, and your struggles are the same struggles that James has today, then maybe you aren't the problem. Maybe the system is the problem. So I really started gravitating from looking at um, identity and scientific identity, not saying that those aren't important endeavors, but to really, really looking at the structures. But then my doctoral students was like, okay, I'm cool. Thank you for teaching me about structural racism, but I'm in this doctoral program now and I need to get out, right? So I had to take a more pragmatic stance to, you know, as we are fighting for the revolution, there are folks in the system right now. And we certainly want them to thrive and be academic professors because the numbers are so low, 2.4 to 2.5%. It hovers around there for the last 20 years. Yes, I said 20, right? So it's just, you know, this is why the organization that I co-founded is really involved with um, trying to groom STEM doctoral students to be faculty members. I mean, a small cohort of Black faculty can really change the face of engineering and STEM at large. And we also want to be the ones who teach the folks who have to go to Googles and Microsofts and, and other big tech companies because they can't seem to figure it out either, right? So our, our role is in, as academics is multifaceted, but I didn't want to pretend that somehow if you have a 4.0 and you have these glorious internships in NASA, that somehow you're good. You're actually not good. You know, we continue to have structural racism at the highest of the high. You know, in the 62 years of the Nobel Laureate program, we ain't got no black folks. We can't even postponuously have anybody inducted, like not, not even Charles Drew. The father of the blood banks, who's, who, by the way, his blood was unacceptable to be in the American Red Cross because he was Black. Or, you know, Percy Julian, plant, met, plant-based medicines, you know, homeopathic, even marijuana, all the, all the billion-dollar businesses that we have today, you know, foundationally, we can go back to these folks, and they can't even be part of the Nobel Laureate. So we have a long way to go. So we don't want to pretend as though, and I'm going to stop sharing right here, and maybe Lisa, you don't have to put your slide back up since we are actually here, you know, then we don't, we're not going to pretend that somehow just being colorblind and meritocratic and just being on your STEM grind is enough because it's never enough, right? And we're, as we're looking for the dismantling of structural racism in society and in STEM as we know it, you know, I, it was just a pragmatic way to say that we want to make it through, but we're not going to be colorblind and we're going to let you know that here are some of the challenges, but also here's some of the solutions. Thank you all um, for framing this conversation so well. Um, I have a few questions that um, have, have come in and that we've developed together as a group. Um, but I guess my first question would be if, if the one of the actions that we want to take, and we really want to focus here on action, not just on a conversation, right? 
um, if one of the actions is citing more black authors, or citing black authors who are doing work in the areas that, that, um, that we're all engaged with. How do we center that? How do we, how do we, you know, there's some authors, um, for example, one was um, identified, Sarah Ahmed, um, she's, she works in the feminist area and in, in, with minoritized um, issues around minoritized populations. She uses references that are, there are no white authors that she, that she cites. So how do we continue that um, decentering whiteness as the foundation of literature? Uh, I'll start again, and um, um, for, first to answer that question, uh, I think we first have to address the bias in the actual publishing process period, right? And, and this is, uh, in terms of actions, this is where even our communication styles, and Ebony mentioned she laid out how some of the value systems may be different, right, in terms of what, you know, the labor that is required to be a black engineer, or a black engineering professor, right? And so what we actually value and actually valuing those different perspectives that these black scholars are coming, the, the different language in you know, our presentation. And so just even just looking at this panel, this is a distinguished lecture, but we're, we're not dressed like you know, traditional <laughs> distinguished lectures, right? Because our expression is different. And so the community needs to value and see value in that difference as opposed to saying that that difference is deficit. So I think we have to first deal with the bias in the whole publishing process period because the quote unquote blind, okay, we can stop with the blind, right? But finding systematic ways, and I know that Lisa, you have done some of this work even in terms of JEE and developing, you know, ref you know reforming the review process and, and things of that nature, but more journals need to do that, but then also really actively trying to remove the bias from the publishing process in general, and then actually valuing the, the, when black scholars bring something different that our white colleagues may not be comfortable with, but still seeing the value in it. All right, I'll hop in. Um, so in my work, I explicitly talk about citing black scholars and there's a couple angles of it. And I think a lot of folks, what I've seen since then, are people are like, well, let me find black people who, writ who wrote something and then let me pull their name and put it in parentheses and add them to my bibliography. And I think that really waters down the, the goal of what I'm trying to communicate. Um, and, and even the example that was given, when I hear that, I don't think the person it may have been a consequence that they were intentionally not citing white people, but I think what I hear that, I think the intent is to affirm what these people were saying. And so if we get caught into like the fact of like citing black people, you may cite people who their phenotype may be identified as black, but it's more so about what ideas, what values and beliefs are they putting forth that you want to extend or build upon. So for me, citing black people about one, dismantling epistemic appropriation. So a lot of ideas that black folks first put out um, tend to get credit by other white folks who didn't cite them and produce the ideas as if it were they own, their own. So that happens tremendously uh, throughout history and going back to inhumanity, if I don't give you credit, it doesn't matter because you're invaluable. Um, but secondarily, the practice of citation, at least in my perspective, is about well, let me use, I'll use some, you know, building on Leroy's characterizations as Dr. McGee is a, or Ebony as a uh, giant. I saw her work often. Like, I, I keep her book close. I show it up and I'm presenting, not simply because Ebony is black. It's because the way in which she talks about things is very different or it really it was unique to what I was reading. And so when I read her work, I not only agreed, I felt a personal connection to the way she was articulating her ideas. So I cite her to, to affirm that and amplify it and spread that to others who may then read my work, but also to create a pathway where I can then communicate things in the way in which I speak and write and articulate my ideas. So I think citation is about more than simply naming people, extracting quotes. Um, and I put in my piece, I said, to be clear, my encouragement to cite black scholars 
within and beyond engineering education does not simply mean to peruse our work for easily extractable quotes, rather to engage our work with an intellectual curiosity that permits deep learning. And I think the, for, for me, the goal is that you wrestle with the underlying assumptions of what that person is saying. So it's not just simply that they're black people, but when black folks come up from a more radical perspective or alternative value system um, that articulates a different worldview, a different paradigm of defining the problem, defining what the issues are as Ebony just did, I think that allows us to get closer to actually addressing the issues that we see and identifying what the underlying problems are. Yeah, if you're waiting on some profound comment from me, I'm going to keep my comments short today. And I think a lot of what we wrote is there. Uh, I don't, you know, really want to restate it. I question how many people in the audience have even read the pieces. So I would encourage you to do that. Read the rest of the publications we put out. When we're talking about Ebony's work, which is extensive. How many of her publications have you read? Have you bought her book? So I'm not going to go into any deep, you know, again, statements of what you can do to learn. And I feel like you're all grown adults with PhDs who teach classes, you can figure it out. I mean, I hate to sound, you know, kind of harsh, but I think it may be less smiles for me today, less verbiage. Well, but I, I appreciate the comment, Leroy, because, uh, again, what, what I would hope that our audience realizes is the labor. And, and like, you know, you and, you, you and James talked about the emotional state you were in, even in terms of writing this piece, right? And so when we talk about a black tax, this is what we mean in terms of the emotional toil that it takes on us to even produce this document. And so to Leroy's point, we should not have to repeat what we just wrote, right? Can you take, and, and this is kind of the point that I was making, is that the scholarship that already exists from, from scholars of color, if we could actually take it, and, and to, to James's point, and really embrace it and try to put it forward and think about ways to internalize Again, the scholarship that already exists, right? Um, again, even beyond engineering education, right? So can we collectively as a community start to actually value the contributions of scholars who have color who have produced despite, not because of our, invite, our environment? And I'll stop there. So I, I really appreciate and resonate with the comments of my young warrior scholar colleagues. Um, I'm going to go in a different direction. So the first university mathematics course was taught in 1726 at Harvard. What were my people doing in 1726? We were enslaved. But let you know, we were not simply picking cotton. We were engineers, we were architects, we were designers, we were creators, we were um, the builders of this country. We were not simply picking cotton. The first university class in medicine started in 1765, where they tortured, burned, and battered Black people, including Black newborn babies, in the name of science. The first engineering course was in 1817. My people were continued to be enslaved and our innovations were stolen from us. They were either buried or stolen. And you wonder why would a white slave owner bury an innovation? Because if the innovation was to come out and, that, and they knew that the innovator was a black enslaved person, that would somehow make him human. And it was important to keep those folks um, positioned as inhuman as possible. The first physics course happened in the 1880s. That was during the time of the black codes, right? This was prior to Jim Crow. The first computer science course, and I'm gonna end here, was in 1962. And that was during the time of Jim Crow. The residue and the film the nasty film is still with us. So I would propose that we need to go back to the history of STEM. Like, let's be clear, statistics was founded by eugenicists. Physics courses were taught by Nazis. I can go on and on, but I'm just gonna stop right there. 
and let and we pretend as though STEM is somehow innocent, neutral, non-political, universal, and meritocratic. And it's time for us to call BS on that. This is very powerful, and I really appreciate your 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 honesty and your energy um, bringing this this conversation. Um, I would like to say at this point, um, if we have we have a, a lot of folks attending, which is great to see. If you have questions that you'd like to the panel to discuss, please post them in the chat. I think in Pathable, the conference platform is where you can you can post questions. You can't. I don't think the chat in Zoom is actually. In, uh, is actually active. Um, if, if I could, uh, Lisa, just one thing I, I'll add because, and, and thank you for, again, educating us all, Ebony, as, as you have throughout this process, right? Um, again, I want to encourage my colleagues who are not familiar with the history that she just laid down. You can look it up. Like, you can Google it. Like, the fact that, you know, and, and this was in my piece where I talked about, you know, even in the Constitution, we were labeled as three-fifths of a human being. So, okay, so understand that these things are socially constructed. And so don't get discouraged and overwhelmed, but actually find your way in, right? So wherever you need to pick up the pendulum, you know, and, and I talked about this in the video a little bit, and I'll say it again here. Sweep around your own front yard. Start with yourself, right? Stop thinking that it's some big thing that you have no control over. You do control you. To, to Leroy's point, pretty much everybody in this call has a PhD. So, okay, you can control you. So pick and choose where you want to pick up this mantle, start your learning process, and the things that you can do in your own world and in your own space that you have control of where you can disrupt this cycle. Okay? So, yes, what Ebony said is heavy. I get it. But as you can see, we carry this every day. I don't get to put this down. I don't get to forget. I don't get to shy away from it, right? I don't get to do that. Every day, I've been black all day, all week long, okay? So find a way to engage with the topic. Wherever you need to start, start there. Start someplace. Do something is what I'm saying, as opposed to saying it's too much, okay? So, and I'll stop now. Okay, I just wanted to give panelists a chance to um, respond to Kelly's call, which is incredible. Um, it is overwhelming. Um, just wanted to give a moment there. Um, Um, shut up for 30 seconds. I'm, I'm going to say something. Um, the more that I talk to my white colleagues, the more I realize that there has to be some grace to be given. So remember, we have all drank the white supremacy Kool-Aid, like all of us. And right now, if you think you're not drinking it, you sipping it still, right? We're still in this capitalistic, you know, version of what we think STEM innovation is, right? I mean, the reason why we are so important is not be is not because we want institutions to be anti-racist. It is because we want institutions to be more profitable. And now that we know that diversity equals higher profit. So it's a very capitalistic reason for even, you know, embarking on diversity, equity, and inclusion. But, you know, as one, one of my colleagues told me, we'll take it, you know, if it, if it makes the place safer, you know, safer for, you know, our babies. 
Um, so with that being said, I do feel as though it is my job and responsibility to lay down some groundwork, some foundation, um, particularly for those in STEM. I'm even talking about the Black folks in STEM who, who also have bought into some of the meritocratic principles or, you know, I've heard STEMers more than any other group say Black STEMers that, you know, racism doesn't particularly affect me. And, you know, it's by design that they think and they feel that way uh, because that's what we that's what we're taught, particularly if you're a high achiever, you're an anomaly, you're a freak of nature. Like people say this, right, that you're a genius. Right. I mean, regardless, if you're just a hard worker, you on your grind. No, you must be something must be different about you, like biologically in order to succeed in this place and space. So I do feel it is part of my responsibility to give more guidance to white faculty who really want to try to what Kelly said, you, you got to either give up or share your power. Anything else is optical white allyship. We don't need you to change your page to Black Lives Matter. Like we don't need that. Like give up or share your power. So I just wanted to say that I don't feel so burdened to do that. Um, and we might want to just make room for those who actually do want to help, but just truly just don't know how. Knowing that some of it might be BS, you know. <laughs> right, right. A lot of what happens is, is giving lip service to things. Um, where at the core of our practices, and, and, and I so appreciate you bringing this to, to my attention as the editor of a journal, um, in the, you know, a journal in our field, that there are racist practices in engineering publications. And one example that is just, it's front and center, it's in front of me every day, is that our mission statement, or, you know, the not admission, the um, areas of research that, that are within the scope of JEE. One of them is engineering diversity and inclusiveness, which sounds really nice until you look at how we define it. We define it as how human diversity contributes to engineering processes and products. And I think that's, that, that encompasses what, what Ebony is talking about, that we're, we're looking at like, what can diversity do for our bottom line? Not looking at it as what what um, strengths and, and, and perspectives um, diverse populations can bring and, and what, what um, yeah, it's not about the bottom line. It's not about um, promoting capitalist agendas. Well, and, and to that point, I, I mentioned this earlier in the week that it's also, you know, that loss of talent. There is so much loss of talent and time and energy um, you know, if just, <laughs> again, from, from people being frustrated about social factors and, and we lose that talent, right? And, and so that, that's the other piece that, you know, that, that perspective that, that, uh, that sort of gets lost is that whatever that student or that person, you know, that, that person of color had to bring that could move us all forward is, is lost and it's never recovered, right? And, and so um, to your point, Lisa, it's, it's not just about, the, the bottom line, again, uh, I think James said this about just being present. It's about being present, but also active and engaged and actually appreciated, right? And actually allowed to participate and bring in that different perspective, right? It's actually being heard and not just tolerated, right? It's actually being valued, right? As opposed to just being, oh, you're different and I don't understand, right? So uh, again, I'm going to keep driving it's our values and our mindsets and our, right, those are the things that we need to be working on changing, right? Because wh where can we disrupt, right? Think about places where, where we can disrupt. Yeah, since we keep talking about capitalism, I'm just going to say something that comes to my mind, which is like pay up or shut up. Um, and I do believe in reparations and why you may not feel like you have the ability to change the government's mindset towards it. I mean, Ebony again has a book. Have you bought it? You know, I have poetry books. Have you bought those? And my progress even going to scholarships for black students. You know, we're not paid to do this. So that's another regret I have. It makes me feel like I should apologize to everyone on here. That This is the third instance in which 
you're giving away labor for free. You know, I've given three or four invited talks going up for tenure and just wanted to hit the CV, only got paid for one. I had to request, you know, some funds for that. So stop taking advantage of us. Stop, you know, thinking that just talking to us or patting us on the back or shaking our hands after a talk is going to make a difference. Again, I'll go back to, you know, put up or shut up. So I actually want to see funds being directed to people like us who value our communities and can, you know, put money in the hands of people who need it. Powerful, powerful messages uh, for everyone. Um, it's it for, from my perspective as a journal editor. Again, I'm thinking about centering publications as the you know the the sort of the coin of the realm in in our academic community. Um, how do we promote anti-racism in our publication processes? How how do we um, include more um, diverse voices in the publication process? How do we ensure that it's, it, that it's not racist? How do we get more um, diverse perspectives as you know, program chairs and editorial board members? I don't know if any of you, you know, can speak to the, that academic publication, sort of where you know, that's part of the put up and sh or shut up piece. I mean, we don't all have a lot of money, but we do have attention. We do have energy. How is that spent? Where is it focused? Well, I, I, I think you're, you're, with that, Lisa, I, I personally think you're, you're speaking to administrators in that point because, because like, you know, Lee Warren mentioned, you know, he was submitting his packet, right? <laughs> James and I are on tenure track positions, right? So what of our labor, again, this hidden labor that is often there, where do we get compensated for that, right? Where this is where, you know, looking at Ebony's model about how you actually support, you know, black people coming through this pop or, you know, people of color or whoever or LGBTQ, whatever. Um, how do you support them in, in ways that will allow their actual labor to, to be valued and compensated for, right? And so to, to the point, where does this figure into our tenure process, right? Um, and I'll just speak for myself. I do have invitations to multiple journals to be in, you know, an editor or you'd be a part of the editorial staff. But I have been advised to not do that until I get tenure. Right. And so even though I would like to influence and do this right, but I'm still within this function of, of what we call tenure. <laughs> right. And so that reality, we need administrators and those who are supposedly leading us, right, and guiding our careers to also be sensitive to that there is a ton of hidden labor that happens, right? It, whether it's writing journal, whether it's sometimes it could just be reading feedback from our work, right? There is a lot of hidden labor that, that we don't get a chance to necessarily talk about in process. And so, again, I, I want to challenge wherever your positionality happens to be, find your way into doing more and to be active about it, right? So I think... With that, what you're talking about, to me, that is administrators, that is department heads, that is senior, you know, more senior faculty. Again, what is why I appreciate Ebony so much, even though, you know, she's calling us, I'm not quite that young. But the point is, is that Ebony is a beacon of light to us, right? So what other lights do we have? I'll stop there. So I'll uh, hop in. We want to give a shout out to Brian Burke for um, getting the Wickenden Award or, or earning the Wickenden Award as best paper uh, for providing the best paper in JEE. And I think this question is critical, but as someone new to the publishing space and even now having an opportunity to be on the other side of reviewing and, and ed, you know editorial ship and things like that, first we we there needs to be a, a real construction of knowledge or conception about what racism is and how it works, right? Because um, I think a lot of folks want to counteract something that they don't fully understand. They're looking more interpersonal, like who's being mean to each other, who is saying negative things to certain people rather than realizing how it's embedded in the structures of how we uh, how we operate. For example, um, with Brian Burr's work, I mean, that was really transformative in a lot of ways because he studied one person. 
And traditionally, a lot of publishing and, and folks who review value epistemolo the epistemological norm or dominant practice is that you need to have a widespread generalizability. And so for him to study one person and for that paper not to get published, but to be elevated as the best paper available really is a shift for a lot of people who still struggle to see the value in studying one individual, um, particularly someone who identifies with the group that is ostracized and excluded. Um, another dynamic uh, of that is as far as how racist structures work is the practices of citation, going back to that. Um, a lot of times it's about who has the most citations or how much, whether than the quality of your work, it's about who else is affirming your work. Well, if black scholarship, black epistemologies are not supported, then people may read it they, if they even choose to read it. They may just ignore it. But if they choose to read it, it may sit with it. But if it doesn't fit with the network, they're not, they're not going to affirm it by citing it in something else. And so that causes us to support each other through the practice of citation. But again, it's one of those kind of invisible norms that white people cite other names that they know, uh, people who have been affirmed as knowledgeable and not those who may be new because people don't know about them or know about their work. So we're not reading, or the community is not reading papers and evaluating them based on the quality of what's being presented, but rather who they know um, and who they like even, which is even more subjective. Um, another issue in which racism shows up is a lot of people, you know, this is the educational research methods division, right? And so in theory, you have to have an expertise. You have to gain the expertise of educational research, which as far as I know, most people don't get trained in that when they come through a traditional engineering PhD. And you get a little bit of that if you come through a traditional engineering education de uh, department. Um, but it requires that you read outside the discipline. You have to develop expertise within the discipline of education, which is just because we learned and went through school systems that have education don't mean we understand education from a disciplinary and scholarly perspective. And so to read one person or to, to know one practice is not enough to be able to evaluate others and their ability to do that particular practice, use that particular framework or methodology. And so we have people, if I do something like autoethnography, not if, when I do autoethnography, uh, when Brian does narrative inquiry, uh, people are struggling to, to really understand and process it, let alone uh, 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 evaluate or, ju or judge it. They're struggling to know what is this, how is this even valid, despite writing that out. And so the ways in which papers are constructed, I can't even spend too much time actually laying that out for the reviewer. I have to make sure it's concise to, to get to the findings because people just want to know what, what's the takeaway from this rather than engaging with the explanation of the process. And so you have people who are not uh, well read, who don't know enough um, evaluating these papers. Another way is the people who tend to be on those boards who have extra time are who? White people. Right? Like we wrapped up in service or other things or just trying to survive. Like what Kelly's talking about, trying to get to the other side of tenure, trying to be black in America. And so we are uh, tied up and either not, don't have the availability or encouraged not to spend our time that way. Um, and, and trying to be on those boards to, to, to offer per, uh, guidance and things like that. And so then we get overtaxed as reviewers, right? A lot of people, they, they request us as reviewers. The editor, edit, editorial board looks to us as reviewers. And we have to, in the same way that HBCUs, right, 3% of colleges and universities produce 25% of black doctoral students. And I think even, uh, I think about 25% of all STEM graduates as well, bachelors in all degree levels. And so we have to, they have to produce an outsized effect when they're being um, suppressed. And disadvantaged in terms of the resource and capacity level. So we embody that as individuals um, having to impact the field at a much outsized way because there aren't enough people who has spent the time to, to, to develop this knowledge base. Um, so I think before we can really get at that, there's some fundamental issues that, that needs to be, because I think it's going to re require a, a total this like reconfiguration of the pub publishing process. Every time about being anti-racist, like that's fundamental to, I mean, any black scholar, intellectual, radical, whatever, they, they you can't just, Put new wine and old wine skins to use a biblical reference, right? You got to recreate that thing, reconstruct that thing so that it can then have the capacity to, to operate in this new way. 
otherwise you're simply putting uh, a new face on a, on a, a, a bad structure. And I, I hate to go back to money again, but since he mentioned HBCUs, I mean, we know that HBCUs receive less funding than historically or predominantly white institutions. So you also are probably in higher salaries than us. You're being on more grants than us, whether that's as a PI, co-PI, advisory board member. You are being paid, you know, guest talks. You should have more money than what we have and what these institutions have. Redirect resources. And so a lot of this stuff is, I mean, like talking, theoretical, it sounds good, but I, I need to see it, you know. So I'm just going to stop there. But again, I'm just kind of in a cynical moment right now. It's a year since everything happened. I don't, I don't feel like you know, there's been much progress. I think a lot of people are uncomfortable when we talk about reaching in your pockets or asking you to actually show us, you know, meaningful change rather than just talking about it. Um, and so that's, that's the point I'm on right now, but I'll start. Well, and actually, Leroy, I'll just add to your point, um, is that I think collectively, again, the injuring, particularly the injuring education community, that we need to start looking at actual data, right? People think that because we have been talking about stuff for, you know, 20 years, but when you actually look at the data, you see that we haven't made a lot of progress. So even to your point about, um, you know, put up or shut up in those various things, some of that is even down to, us actually acting like engineers and using actual data to make decisions about diversity, equity, and inclusion, because that we typically do not. It is typically someone's perception, right? It's typically what someone, well, I feel like, or I think we've been talking about this, so I think, and, I, and I've even had colleagues say that to me, like, you know, hey, Kelly, you know, we've been talking about this for 20 years. I mean, we have had to make progress. And it's like, no, if you look at the numbers, right, if you actually look at the data, you will see that, no, we haven't made an inch of progress. In some areas, we've actually gone backwards. So, again, I would encourage us to be the engineers that we call ourselves and actually use data, look at the data to make those decisions, to find those places where we can actually input and make and make some difference. So, just to add to, to Leroy's point. There's a lot of um, a lot of data and a lot of history that that you've all brought up, um, and it's on us to educate ourselves. We can't keep turning to our black colleagues like, "Hey, Ellie, what was that reference?" Or do you have a reference to fill in the blank of whatever? Um, I guess what recommendations would you have for um, for scholars and educators that do want to do the do the work um, it's hard to know where to start sure and so I, I put a couple of uh, references in the chat um, uh, again just based upon some earlier comments one is about uh, the body is not an apology um, it talks about this um, where again just the very pre presence of, of a black body actually you know under white supremacy it frames a black body as a danger Right. So this, this just kind of goes back to some of the comments earlier that we were talking about. And so then also I put in the chat uh, the, the white logic, white research methods. And, and again, this is kind of what James was talking about, is that understanding that the, the very statistical methods that we use are based in racism. They were established and made <laughs> in a racist framework. Right. So how do we start to unpack that and how do we address that? in our research or in our, you know, in our activities, right, is, is kind of the point. And so that book is, is, a, is, a, is a place to, to start. And, and again, like I said, there are a different, there are many, many different ways where you can find entry points. And so if you are a researcher, if you are a, uh, you know, you're over some program, there are ways for you to find, you know, if you're an instructor, there are ways for you to implement and, you know, adopt culturally responsive teaching, for example, within your practices, right? There are ways to adopt anti-blackness concepts within your teaching practice, right? So again, wherever your positionality happens to be, you, you can start there somewhere. Again, I'm going to go back to the money again. I know there's a $23 billion funding gap between uh, predominantly black and brown K-12 schools and ones that serve uh, predominantly white students. 
and you also are situated, many of you are, at universities that were founded off of the labor of black bodies, you know, unpaid labor. Um, you also are institutions that deny black people access um, to come there, still deny black people access. So when you get invited talks and you're paid, how about you take that money, you redistribute it to people who actually need it. That money's not yours, you know. When you're getting this extra money through grants, maybe you should redistribute that money as well. Partner with HBCUs intentionally. Partner with Black and Brown K-12 schools intentionally. So I want to see resources being distributed. And that's where the extra money that I was talking about is. I'm not saying that you are millionaires by any means, but if you're getting a few thousand dollars sitting on extra boards, a few thousand dollars speaking, quit using that money to go on vacations and buy bigger houses, bigger cars, um, and dress nicer and give it to people in need. That's, that's honestly what I'm thinking right now in terms of what can be done. And your publications are currency. It allows you to have more talks. It allows you to get more grants. So there is real money coming from the conversations we're having right now. And I would like to see that money distributed. And I, I added a resource in the chat uh, to, to, to illustrate uh, Leroy's point about the, 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 the gap in terms of education, the shame of the nation. Uh, it lays that out, the gap, the, the wealth gap between black and white students being educated. Yeah, so just FYI, Kelly, they can't see those. I've been copying them to the Pathable platform. I don't know if you can do that, but if not, just keep doing it. I just keep. Moving. I got I, it. I'll, I'll get. I'm. Uh, you copied. Put them in there. Yeah, it's cool. Yes, I was I'm, I'm uh, Kelly, don't worry about. It. I got you copied over. Um, can I? Uh, in the spirit of keeping that conversation going, um, and moving forward from it, um, I, I did ask Lisa if I could ask a question. Um, so. Before this year, if, if we're going to, you know, let's talk practical here about things within our power. And um, when we were planning for the call for papers for ERM for this year's conference, um, James, you worked with me on, you know, language that we could change and that call for papers. I don't know if you remember, we, I think you'll remember. Oh, but yeah. we <laughs> remember, so we, like, I took out what I thought were your recommendations and then I sent it to you. You said, no, this is actually more of what I was thinking, you know, made some edits. And then we put some, um, you know, we, we moved them into that call for paper. So now if we're incorporating in the, within the ERM division, you know, calls for frameworks that center hope um, and uh, coming at, you know, the, the, the list of things that we are looking for. So now when you think about as a division, as a society that does research, what's next for us then? Like, I can think of things, but I really want to hear from you. So now in our call for papers, we're saying, um, here, let me, I had it pulled up, um, frameworks that center hope and contextualize despair, research methods that center the Black perspectives um, to stop blaming K-12 education, um, for the disparities, studies that contextualize success, cite Black scholars. So obviously we weren't perfect. Obviously there are papers that are still not doing those things. But it, what ideas do you have for us as a division moving forward? Like how can we continue to make changes here? Yeah, so I think that like, these are hard answers i don't think the questions are but i think the answers are hard, right so when you start up and say let's talk more practical i don't think anybody said anything impractical right i think that what we're trying to say is you have to move outside trying to do something within this discipline and think about how do i as a human being first within the as a within this united states society be, begin to like we we before we engage engineering education engineering undergraduate we were black right so we grew up most likely in black communities and we, we learned a lot there. So a lot of, before I even started reading books, I was living. And that was that was the education for me. W.B. Du Bois said education is the training of the human experience. Like it's not just about going to school. I learned a lot about social dynamics, about how I operate out in the world. And so I think what we're trying to say is until you're willing, or people are willing to say, I need to go outside this thing and reconfigure my paradigm. To, uh, I, whatever I do within this is not going to be adequate. And it may not even be helpful. It may have to cause more issues because people are more concerned about doing the right thing rather than developing the right understanding. Um, a lot of folks talk about unconscious racism and bias or, or ignorance or lack of education. Well, I follow Joyce E. King who said there's a disconscious racism. 
um, there's a miseducation that's taking place where people have a misunderstanding of the causes of the social inequities. So if you have that broader misunderstanding of the broad the social U.S. sociological context, that's going to inform how you then approach problems. Even if you reword it, even if I tell you do X, Y, and Z, that's fundamentally what's in you spiritually, right? Um, and so I think you know even with Leroy's point around reparations, I would push it much broader between individual actions. You need to see why we need to be advocating to the government to pay that debt that is owed and figuring that out, right? Because then it's about, it's not about just paying people or just trying to get it solved. You realize that we have some fundamental structures that will forever prevent equality, equity, those things, and liberation being realized, no matter what you do, if those things are not uh, un uh, un unraveled or whatever. Right. So I think in the same way in engineering education, engineering education, I see a lot of ways is a microcosm of the United States sociological context where until we uproot some things, the red, what we're doing is just existing within that system. And so for me, part of that means bringing in these other perspectives that 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 talk about that, that give language to that. So I think what other folks need to do is, is begin to absorb and embrace those realities. Um, I, I don't think even with changing the language of the the uh, the cause and things like that, you try to figure out. Like I think it's worthwhile to applaud people who are trying, um, developing sensitivity, um, making like moving differently, listening to cause that go out. But I think this has to be more uh, a holistic thing. In the same way that we embody blackness. In the same way that Kelly said, we can't turn this off. Unless people put that same energy into this, then it, I don't, like, I'm struggling to, su I can suggest some stuff. I have suggested stuff, but I think until people really, when you walk outside of, you're still thinking about how does racism show and anti-blackness show up and how I spend my money, the institutions that I connect with, uh, the type of food I eat, uh, how I raise my children, how I interact with my spouse. Um, how I choose schools for my children or educational institutions, how I vote, how I, uh, the, the type of religious institution that I attend and, and how it, 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 like, what a lot of folks miss, I think, from the perspective of the theoretical framework that I use, critical race theory, is like, it, it permeates everything. And so you can't operate in this space without changing the rest of the spaces. And rather, those other things have a broader influence because that's how we come to know who we are within this context. So we can... And I'm not discouraging anybody from giving tips, but I mean, you have people, this is their life. So what, that's, like, you have people professionally going around explaining to people how to be quote, quote anti-racism and those type of things. And yet here we are, right? Here we are. We're still here. And, and, and I think it also reifies Leroy's point of like, y'all still asking us questions. <laughs> stop, stop asking us what to do. Like, go do it. You know what I mean? Like, go make some mistakes. Like, go figure it out. And so I think, you know, then building on Ebony's point, yes, we were black, but it took education, too, that had its place. But the biggest education was experiential mistreatment and dehumanization. Um, and that forced us to operate. And so what you all have to figure out is when you're in the place that you're not being pushed out, but you are inadvertently pushing out or sometimes intentionally, let's be real, you have to figure out how to do that, how to, how to develop that consciousness and helpful awareness to where we're not seeking to claim unconsciousness, but we're actively and consciously acting to work in a different model, in a different mold, with a different viewpoint. Wow, that was a word. Um, I just wanted to say that we did this in education a few years back, and I want to share some of what I learned. So same discussion, you know, we want our journal articles to be more inclusive of equity, diversity, speak out about, I don't think we called it racism back then, we called it discrimination. And what happened where there were a series of articles about resilience and grit, right? Do you guys, do you, scholars, you all remember this? You know, resilience and grit is the key. Remember, it's still going on. True. <laughs> Truth, truth. Even though we know grit ain't really a thing, like she made that whole thing up. But anyway, you know, this was the key to, uh, you know, having high achieving students of color to just instill resilience and grit as if they didn't have it already. Right. 
And now what we're finding out is, and I mean, I, a lot of folks drank this Kool-Aid. The title of my dissertation started off as resilience, right? Because I've been told I've been resilient. People assume I'm resilient because I'm successful, right? So I have drank in this Kool-Aid too. So I want to say like, you know, folks of color are not immune to, you know, kind of taking up these places and spaces. But I learned quickly that you can be as resilient or as gritty as one possibly can. First of all, it will kill you. I'm talking about a premature death. So we die six to seven years earlier than other white doctors, white engineers, white lawyers, et cetera, right? white scientists, okay? And secondly, what we are really asking our students and faculty or people of color to do is to exist within their oppression. So grit and resilience is not a do-it-yourself endeavor. You want to be as resilient as the next white, heterosexual, upper middle class male that is sitting next to you that's getting all these advantages and opportunities where you have to carry a boulder on your shoulder every time that you walk into the university. That's not what that is, is oppression. And what you are doing is you are killing black and brown bodies by doing that, right? So to your point, um, Carrie, we really, really need to be careful how we are positioning you know, what's good for black and brown bodies, right? And what we are accepting is scholarship because that was a whole scholarship of oppression. Let's try to fix the student and then let's leave the institution as, um, let's leave the, the institution as racist, as sexist, as biased as it can be, right? So one of the, one of the reasons why making sure the scholars have that uh, lived experience as James was talking about, is you know that they're just not buying into the next cookie cutter approach, you know, to somehow assimilate the student towards being successful. Oh, and one other thing, I'm, I'm sorry, I wanna say one other thing to Jane's point. Yeah, so we're talking about like, what can we do? And we're talking about, you know, infusing these algorithms. That's what, that's what basic, when I hear questions like this, like, what can we do? I hear, what algorithm can I use to make this decision? And it's not an algorithmic decision. And then we have places like Tennessee State University who are owed $544 million by the state of Tennessee, right? Getting back to Leroy's plan about reparations. I don't really necessarily need other white faculty to, you know, drop me some money. It would be nice. But we all pay into a government that is supposed to supply equitable resources to these land grant institutions that are not doing that. So this is government sanctioned racism and discrimination. If we can just get the government to do what they that they're supposed to do for black and brown bodies and that type of reparations, y'all can keep your money. You know, we can all get rich. <laughs> we have an incredible conversation going on here um, that I, I so appreciate. Again, uh, seeing energy. Um, we have a question from uh, Lauren Thomas in the audience. Um, what would Black Joy in engineering education, teaching, practice, and research look like for you? We are so often called to do this labor and often do it for the benefit of community, for educating our students and our colleagues. It's exactly what you're trying to tell us. Um, sometimes it comes with joy, but what if joy was the core and not the uphill battle of fighting anti-Blackness? Um. Well, Lauren, first, thank you, Lauren, for the question. Um, but even that, I, I think we need to be careful as to what we call joy, because what, you know, what joy means to one person may mean something different. And so I think overall, I think joy, the, the same human emotions that every other race has, right? We want to be acknowledged. We want to be valued. We want to be heard, you know, <laughs> those those same sort of emotions. And so I, I think that's all that we're asking for is, again, is to be seen as human. Um, and, and so uh, what that, how that translates to, to, to joy. 
um, I think that they are the same human emotions like any other, any, anybody else uh, would, would, would want and need. Um, just one thing I wanted to add to, to Ebony's point, um, that I think I put in the chat um, a, a, another editorial that I did, but I did talk about how, to, to Ebony's point, uh, how the racism does have physical consequences. But I highlighted the point of how this, th this conversation about resilience and that, you know, there was this perception medically that black people had a higher tolerance for pain. And this was in the medical field for years, right? And so that, those are the ways in which these races, the things that we're talking about, this institutionalized racism and how it, it infuses our science and STEM community, right? Is, this is the, one of the examples of that where for the medical field for years had this perception because of this grit and this quote unquote resilience that there was a perception that black people had a higher tolerance for pain for than other races. And so, and it took a lot of significant research to dispel that myth, but that was a deeply held belief for years to the point to where, you know, black people were denied pain medication and various treatments and various things to, to offset, you know, even, you know, after surgery and things of that nature. And so again, there, understand that there are real consequences about what we're talking about, right? There is actual physical consequences for the things that, that we're bringing up. And so I, I just wanted to make, make that point as well. And uh, just to continue that point, it's still going on. I mean, you mentioned, you know, the physical toll. I agree with Ebony that I made mistakes and when it comes to pushing for resilience type of work with buoyant believers and not putting that in the proper context. Um, and even how it can be misconceived with why, what I'm doing with student athletes. And really that's to kind of piggyback on what Ebony's been doing foundationally for years now, which is to say, you know, we can be successful, at least or perceived to be successful on paper, but it comes with many bruises. And student athletes do a lot of free labor. You know, you think a scholarship is paying them, but it's really not for all they're doing in terms of publicity and just raw earnings coming to coaches, administrators, entire units on campus. Um, the same is true for many black students. They're in your classes and they're having to work off campus and do other things to provide for themselves or their family. But then they're expected to be that same student as maybe your fluent white male who all he does 24 seven is engineering homework. You know, so we need to make up for those those gaps. And that's why I'm pushing the resource piece and pushing the funding piece just to say that there's a real cost. I have a student at my institution who I will not name. He's a Gates Millennium Scholar and still works. I believe two jobs to support his family off campus. So on paper, you would assume all of his financial needs are taken care of, but they're not, you know? So making sure that we provide adequate resources for those individuals. And I'm not trying to put any undue burdens on you all that I wouldn't put on myself. I do take parts of my salary and distribute it. And so that's the reason I'm asking you all to do it too. I'm not trying to, you know, create some unnecessary burden or hypocritical type of request by any means. I have a picture of Black Joy, my definition of Black Joy. I'd like to share it really quickly. So this is my version of Black Joy. So this is, this is what I see um, in terms of Afrofuturism. It's not going to align, right? So don't just look at it as he is, but Afrofuturism, you can see the definition. It's a, it's like sci-fi. So it's science, it's fiction, it's art, it's music, it's the centering of the African diaspora, right? So I'm not looking at the Jetsons or, you know, even things that I see on TV today. I like, I want to go ahead and cure cancer for everybody. I want to go ahead and uh, transition from begging these STEM companies to hire us to like, let's go ahead and do our own thing. And, you know, we're talking about colonizing other planets right now, right? And Dr. Mae Jemison, I'll stop sharing so I can tell this story. Um, Dr. Mae Jemison, who's my girlfriend in my mind, she's not really my girlfriend, but I talk to her often. <laughs> And one of the things that she says is that if we don't figure out what she first says, we will have the technological cap capability to go to Mars very soon. But if we don't figure out how to behaviorally get along with each other and understand equity and inclusion and diversity and celebrate that, 
we are going to reproduce the same isms on Mars, Moon, Jupiter, wherever that we, that are reproduced uh, on this planet, and we will end up killing other planets like we're killing this planet. That last part I just added on, but I I, I believe she would agree with me. So I do. I see black joy. I still tell people, even though I trip on the academy, this is the best job I ever had. You know, I'm going to retire as a faculty member. So I do appreciate the question. And I think that some of the things that I'm trying to do is trying to give a more balanced approach of what being a faculty member is, both the challenges as well as the joys and opportunities. I was able to pick up my son every day of the week when he was in high school at three o'clock. Like, you know, there's just some things you just can't beat being the, in the academy. So I, I really value that question. And I apologize for not answering Lauren's question. Kelly, you can go first and I'll come back. Oh, no, I, I just want to say really quickly that I, I Again, I think I'm thankful for the question because I think we would be remiss if we didn't at, at least mention the mental health aspects of, of some of this as well. Um, so that, that that's all I wanted to say. Go ahead, Leroy. Yes, I mean I also want to thank Laura for her question and just even being on the chat. Um, but for me, it kind of looks like LeBron James is our promise school. The reason I even got a PhD in STEM education with a focus on engineering education is because I still want to start a school where black youth can experience joy fully and unapologetically and just be their, their whole selves. And so having more access to a space like that through service, research opportunities, that would be a part of it for me. And then I also think, and this is a sheer interest with Monica Cox, and I feel bad that I can't be there for black and engineering. And also they have a donation link if you want to go to black and engineering.org and donate there. But Monica talks about the media, um, in that industry. And so like, if we could do more and we could be present and help with movies like Black Panther, or just like what the Obamas have, I can't think of the new animation that's gonna be on Netflix. But if, you know, Ebony, myself, Kelly, James, anyone else who's interested, if we could actually be tapped for that and then put our stories there, stories that would be powerful for us. Ebony mentions like inspiration for the Jetsons. Maybe Ebony has an idea for the black version of the Jetsons and she, you know, could push that forward and that could create black joy. So for me, it would be like that school, I promise type school, and seeing us represented in you know great ways in the media. Thank you, Leroy and Kelly and Ebony. I don't, James, I don't know if you wanted to contribute to this conversation too. But we have um, about 15 minutes left and I feel like this entire, we're recording this session, and the entire session should be required to be viewed by all engineering faculty, and certainly our graduate students that are, that are studying STEM education and engineering education. Um, so one of the things that James had mentioned when, in our earlier conversation, when, when we um, started this conversation, was a, sort of, a, communal action, um, communal interaction, I guess. Um, not you telling us what, you know, always answering our questions, holding our hands, helping us figure it out, um, but truly an interaction um, where we can um, make things better, have greater changes, better decisions, working together. Um, what, what might that look like? Um, especially for, the, as, as Ebony called them, the young warrior scholars um, of all colors. Um, what would a community interaction look like? Well, yeah, uh, one, um, I, 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 listening to that play back, I want to offer some context and clarification. When I, like, my work all the ethnography is about telling my story for the sake of education. Um, to address you know, some new course versus equity. So I just want to clarify, like, my point is not saying that I'm not here to help you or I don't want you to talk about how to do these things better. I just think a lot of times the questions are like, what can we, like, they're so broad and they're not specific. Someone isn't necessarily wrestling with a concert. Someone isn't necessarily um, speaking about some stuff that, you know, haven't even talked about in their book, Black, Brown, and Groups. 
Uh, so I think the, the thing is a lot of times black specificity, which can communicate a lack of uh, really engaging and being thoughtful about the, the proposed solutions or or being put out. So I, I first want to say that um, as far as community interaction, um, you know, I think it really requires once going back to your spaces and thinking about the norms of operation, how we create, how we just, what we put and what we don't put in our syllabi, the type of conversations that we're having in our research groups, uh, really doing some self-examination. Um, because I think that if we are interacting collectively and folks haven't thought about themselves, whether it was just knowing how they're situated in that community, then that's going to inhibit our ability to really grow, have an exchange of ideas, engage in conflict um, for the sake of growth. And I think, you know, and, I, and, and being, having the opportunity to introduce the, the equity culture or be a part of the leadership team on equity culture and social justice and education division, what I've seen is a lot of people want to have a conversation, but people don't want to be self-reflective about how they're entering the conversation, what they have or haven't done prior to. Um, and so they may be, you know, in our own division, yeah. folks may be saying and espousing ideas that are actually contrary or contradictory and problematic to what we want to espouse as, a, as an academic community. Um, and I think that folks have to be able to identify what those areas are. And another part is being open to conflict, you know, people disagreeing with you, people actually saying that what you're talking about is wrong. <laughs> uh, like a lot of folks don't want to deal with that. So we can have these discussions and community interaction, but if we can't uh, make space for critique, for this, you know, constructive criticism, like a lot of times we're trying to respond to harm that's been done. We're trying to encourage folks to do things better, but we're, we get accusations of being uh, harmful or aggressive or angry and upset, you know, so I think community interaction is also looking at one stuff before even engaging in that uh, I, I was just going to jump in and say, um, I, I think one approach, um, I think we, we need to think about interest convergence and how do we actually think about, you know, how we, uh, you know, Ebony mentioned a little bit about, you know, your privilege and bending your privilege, right? So wherever you may have privilege, how can you bend that so that other people can benefit from that privilege? But just looking at where we could benefit collectively, right, and, and really being more um, uh, thoughtful about that, again, that it's not just benefiting one person, but how can it benefit others around me? And so I, I, I would start, uh, to answer your question directly, Lisa, I would start with Derek Bell with interest convergence. That, that's where I would start. I'll just say really quickly, Derek Bell, the father of critical race theory. I'm kind of questioning interest conversions right now because there are Republicans dying dying over this coronavirus, like they won't get a shot. So I'm thinking about the work of Dying of Whiteness um, by Jonathan Metzl that say the interest, the interest conversion for COVID would be for everybody to get a shot, right? It's in their best interest, but they're not doing it. I'm here in Tennessee. Only 50% of the people down here have gotten a shot. And I, I may be assuming that it's mostly white male Republicans. You know, I may be erroneous in that assumption because I know, you know, black folks have a right to be fearful of the medical system. Um, but it's, it's something happened. They are on their death. So my, I have colleagues that work at the Vanderbilt Medical Center. They are on their deathbeds cursing COVID as a myth like seconds before they pass away. So this is just a really, really scary time for me, Kelly. And I want to believe that interest conversions would do it, but I'm not so sure. Which interest conversions mean that the interests of white uh, or people in power 
would meet the interests of Black people. And thus it would be done because it would be a shared interest among both parties, just in case people, but definitely read Derrick Bell. He is, he's still the father. <laughs> No, I, I appreciate that, Ebony, yeah, because, um, and, and it is, it's complex, but uh, again, that, that was my point, is because even what James is saying, I think even dialogue is also very important, so yeah, I, I was offering that as a place to start, but yeah, COVID is a, a good example of the complexities of how, you know, this is, and, and thank you for, for pro providing that, that definition, um, so um yeah, um, I, I think that, that COVID is, again, uh, and James said this earlier, that it's a microcosm of all of what's happening in society, and engineering is reflecting that, right? And so this whole questioning of science and questioning of our government, and just, right, and how we can't, we can't quite trust the medical field and this, right? And, again, I, I forget which author said it, but um, they said, you know, when America has the cold, black people have the flu. Right, understanding that that <laughs> that is disproportionately impacting. Right, so so yes, I, I, I take your point that yeah, interest convergence is not the only thing, but yeah, I was just offering it as a place to start. If if COVID is a microcosm for all of. Um, the experience and it's 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 basically torn away the veneer that we that we've placed over all of the inequities and all the injustice that, that's been going on in our society for hundreds of years. Then, do you think this is a moment where we can have these these communal interactions where finally we get the exhaustion that our colleagues of color are feeling? that we understand this you know, constantly, the uphill battle, um, it, because we're, we're fighting to stay alive. Very much sort of like, I, I think, Rick Coley has called, called it racism. If there's, if there's COVID-19, there's racism 20. That, that they have occurred hand in hand, and maybe um, it's, I'm not gonna say it was you know, fortuitous, but it's, it's an opportunity, certainly, for people to finally recognize what that what that exhaustion and that uphill battle is like. I mean, I'm a person of faith, so I certainly believe it's possible. Dr. King challenged white moderates. He thought it wasn't like the bold, racist, the uh, you know conservative white Republicans that we're talking about right now, or maybe students in your class who say and do obvious racist things. But it's you know white people are just comfortable. You know, and I'm willing to be bold. And so that's why I even was challenging people throughout. Would you give, what are you willing to give up? That would be my final point. I mentioned maybe some of your salary or extra salary. What are you willing to give up? Um, because it shouldn't take you benefiting to want to help people. We're all giving up labor. So again, I do apologize for even inviting the other panelists and initiating this, you know, a year ago because they've given up their time and their energy. So what are you willing to give up for the cause? And black people give up their lives too, I should say that. Uh, just, just one last name. I, I know we're wrapping up, but just one last name for, for people who are looking for places of entry. Another name you should be aware of and consider reading is James Baldwin. Ebony, I actually consider James Baldwin. That's my goal. <laughs> so, <laughs> so James Baldwin, uh, some of his speeches, and, and, and uh, he, he articulate these things well. So that's another name you should be aware of. But since we're throwing names out, I'm gonna drop uh, Joyce E. King. Uh, she's a scholar that talks a lot about. I mean, she's in education, but she talks a lot about uh, what she called heritage knowledge, um, Afrocentric epistemology, um, just basically different ways of centering black thought, or and, and not just in the Black American context, but reaching back to. Um, Black folks on the continent, African diaspora, folks on the continent. As you hear, I got a lot of things going on. <laughs> uh, but 
folks on the continent free slavery, right? Because a lot of times even folks are thinking in response to what happened after slavery. Once again, thank you, your energy, your honesty, um, and your time. And uh, again, we're, this session is recorded. I encourage everyone who's attending um, to make this require viewing for all of your students, your graduate students, um, any future educators, administrators. Um, this is where the conversation starts and the action has to start. Um, just a round of applause for, for this amazing distinguished panel. Thank you.